Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Grandview Christian Church. I hope you can grab a Bible and have it with you. Have a pen and a highlighter handy so you can fill it out as we move through the Word of God. We're going to have some worship before and after our message today. I want to answer a question I received. Um, we haven't been getting the worship team to gather together. It has either been me by myself recording, or we have some old recordings of the worship team that I've been getting out and dusting off. Some of them are a couple years old, but we had those on file, and I've been able to get them out, mix them to make them sound good, and add them. So that's why we don't have video of any of the worship, unless it's just me on my guitar. Um, I'm going to do a special announcement at the end of the service tonight, at the very end, so I hope you'll stick around to hear that. And as always, we're going to be doing communion every Sunday morning. Have communion elements around. You should go to the store and grab some grape juice. You'll have it every week. And unleavened bread. Tortillas are unleavened. Pancakes and waffles are unleavened. Waffles might feel weird, but whatnot. Really, any bread works. And so I pray that you'll have communion elements so that we can take communion together. P.O. Box 36 is the church address. And for those who want to give, uh, you can also give online on our app and on our website. Uh, go check it out. It's not too hard to find. And again, you can mail tithe checks in. People have been very concerned about that. And I'm touched that people have been so faithful, even when not coming to church, to continue to give. It's just been a blessing to see uh, the faithfulness of all of our members. And if you're new or you're visiting and you're not a member, you know, that's, that's nothing to be concerned about. This is something that we do to worship God here at our church. Um, you know, aside from that, I, just, I miss you guys. I, I really do. I miss the worship team. I miss getting together and, and worshiping God together. And we'll be getting together again soon. I don't know exactly when yet. But th the second there seems to be a glimpse that it'll be acceptable for us to get together, we will be gathering together again. And I encourage you guys to be keeping in contact on Facebook, on email, via the phone. Uh, we do have on the website and the app a form to fill out for the directory if you want to be a part of the church directory so you can get everyone's phone numbers and emails please fill that out and we will be sending out a list of the directory to everyone who we have an email for that said if you have your name on the directory and we don't have your email I won't be able to email you the directory so I'll be trying to get in touch with people Eventually. I've been very busy, surprisingly, during all this time. But all that said, please grab our, your stuff. We're going to open up into some worship, and let's just pray, and then we'll begin to worship together. Father God, thank you for this day. I pray that you would remove distractions, that you would help us, even though we're in our own homes and we're watching on phones and computers and televisions, that you would just help us connect with you today, to feel your Holy Spirit's presence among us, and you'd bless us, God. We love you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, blessed be your name In the land that is plentiful Where the streams of abundance flow Blessed be your name Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Oh, every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name. The sun shining down. Blessed be your name On the road marked with suffering Though there's pain in the offering Blessed be your name For every blessing you pour out I'll turn back to praise When the darkness closes in Lord Still I will say 
Well, good morning again, and if you are a guest today, you're going to experience something very unusual for our church. I'm going to teach out of a different part of the Bible than normal, and I've got a textual or topical message. Every now and then, I can't study, and usually what happens is God ends up changing things on me in the last minute and just putting a message on my heart and I can't ignore it and I can't get away from it and oftentimes that is God's way of telling me we're gonna break from the norm typically it's chapter by chapter verse by verse we're moving straight through the Bible last Sunday was Easter and I taught from first Samuel because we were at David and Goliath but this week 
I've had another message on my heart, and I think it's important to every Christian, every believer, every unbeliever, every human alive today, this is important. And I sneakily titled the message, The Meaning of Life. I hope that maybe some people would be interested in knowing, why am I here? What is my purpose? Why did God make me? What does everything have to do with me? And what do I have to do with anything? And so it's going to take us to a different text today. But again, it's going to be important. And tonight we're even going to take things a step further. But why are we here? What is our purpose? There is this thing that many of you, I'm sure, who grew up in the church may be familiar with. They were called catechisms. So a, a statement of faith, which most of us are familiar with, or even like a mission statement, those are statements of what we believe. A catechism was also a statement of what people believed, but it was written in the form of question and answer. Here's a question and here's the response. And this question, why am I here? What's the purpose of everything? Why did God make me? Well, we could look to a very popular catechism, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, and the very first part, which I believe a few of you today probably could answer this question. What is the chief purpose for which man is made? The answer in the catechism is the chief purpose for which man is made is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Why did God make you? Well, He made you to glorify Him and enjoy Him forever. I had a friend and a fellow scholar and theologian, and by fellow I mean he is and I'm not, but he's a smart dude, and he said, you know, sometimes I've, I've struggled with the glorify God part. I always feel like the chief purpose God made me was for him to love me and me to love him. And he feels like the second part was more important, the enjoy him forever. But I told him, you know what? And I know he's called to a teaching ministry just like I am. And I'll tell you what, folks. John, 4th John, or sorry, 3rd John. <laughs> There's no 4th John. That'd be Revelation. 3rd uh, John, it says, I have no greater joy than to know my children walk in truth. Now, any believer can enjoy that verse, can respect that verse, but I, I believe that verse, and I, I, I feel that verse. That verse has grown on me over these last few years with such passion that I have no greater joy in this life than to see my children, those whom God has brought into my fold, into my church, and the churches of Grandview and the whole lower valley, any Christian I've been put in contact with, it brings me so much joy to see them walk in truth, to see them growing in Christ, to see them getting out of sin and getting closer to Him and being filled with His Spirit. Truly, this joy, it does. It, it surpasses my wife. It surpasses my children. You see, it's, it's why God made me. He made me to glorify Him and to enjoy Him forever. And when I glorify Him by fulfilling the specific thing He gifted me for, I experience joy in this earth that's insurpassable. When you can find out why God made you, you can experience that joy too. And so this morning we're looking at part one of that. Now, in the Westminster Catechism, they do give a list of verses. You see, we're made to glorify God. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, it talks about us giving our whole lives as living sacrifices, and it's our reasonable service to do so. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Therefore, whatever you eat or drink and whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And one day we will be in heaven and we will see the angels in heaven, to which John writes in Revelation 4.11, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. See, that's the idea. He made everything, and so He deserves glory and honor and praise. It might seem really simple, or I don't know, but think of it this way. How many of you have told your children, because I told you so? And guess what? If you're their mom, if you're the dad, 
you can say that because you made them. <laughs> Children are called to honor their parents regardless. We don't need to obey our earthly parents if they call us to do ungodly and sinful things. But we honor our parents. And the because I told you so is a legitimate reason for a parent to tell a child their reasoning. Because you made them. And God made us. And he made the animals. The birds in the air and the fish in the sea. He made the stars. He made the moon. He made the mountains, the oceans, the grass, and the grain of sand. And so, he deserves glory, just because. But at the same time, he blesses us, and he fills us with joy, and we get to enjoy him. Psalm 144, 15 says, Happy are the people whose God is Yahweh, whose God is the Lord. And it's a thing, we get joy when we serve God and we believe in him. When we obey him, he gives us so much. Philippians 4, 6 talks about the peace that surpasses understanding, 4, 6, and 7. Romans 8, 28 says, God will work all things to the good in your life. And if God's going to give you peace on this earth and work everything to the good, I can enjoy that. That's a life worth living. That's a life worth enjoying. Revelation 21, 3 to 5, you see, because it's not just about enjoying Him here and now. We get to enjoy Him forever. John speaks about hearing this loud voice, and what he hears is, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he, God, will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. See, knowing that I get to enjoy that someday, that creates enjoyment and joy now. I can rejoice in the Lord always because I know that He's got a plan for me. I know that He has a place for me. I know that I have a purpose in this life. But do you believe it? You see, we have to really believe that God can give us this joy. We really have to believe that He is who He says He is. We can't just think it. But when God helps us to really believe it, to believe that He has a purpose for us, that there's no greater joy than serving Him. Once I truly understand there's no greater joy than serving Him in the thing He has designed and created me to do, then I begin to experience the peace. Then I get to experience the joy. Then I get to experience and see it take place, God working all things to the good in my life. I have to believe it like I believe my, my spouse loves me. I have to believe it like I believe that there's air coming in when I take breath into my lungs. I have to believe it with all I am. But it is contingent on us finding out what did you make me to do? And how can I go and do it? You see, how do we glorify God? That's the key. You need to figure out how you glorify God. And I think there's really two or three chief ways mankind can glorify God. And I think the latter two kind of go together. But firstly, it's adding to His kingdom. When we add to the kingdom, bringing souls into the kingdom, it glorifies God. Secondly, is building up and edifying the kingdom, the church, His people. Now, when I meant the third one is attached, it's truly just you yourself, your character, the way you portray yourself to mankind, it glorifies God in heaven. And I feel like I talk about that quite a bit at our church, ways that we can grow as Christians and that glorifies God. But also there's how we edify the church. And I believe every single believer, and I'll even say every human, because I believe God designed every human with the ability and place in His church. If they accept Jesus Christ, they would have a place there. They would have a purpose there. They would have a life of fulfillment there. Not every human comes to repentance, sadly, though it is God's desire that none should perish, but all come to repentance, he tells us. God who desires all men to be saved, all right? But 
We all have a gift and a calling. Tonight, I want to look at that, the different places and callings in the church and the body of Christ and how we can find our place in the body of Christ where God has called us to. But this morning, something every believer is called to is the Great Commission to add to the kingdom, to make disciples. And so hopefully you have your Bible with you because we are going to be going through a scripture and we're going to break down a very small text today, but we are breaking down a text. Please flip with me to Matthew 28 verses 18 to 20. We're just taking the last little chunk of the book of Matthew. And so let's just read the whole text real quick and you know what? We will pray over this text. In verse 18, it says, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would unveil our eyes, that you would soften our hearts, that you would speak to each one of us today, God, that the people who are listening to this right now, God, would seriously examine themselves through the lens of your holy word and that we would allow you, God, to change us. And to make us, Lord, into your disciples. That you would teach us and grow us and stretch us and challenge us. And that we, Lord, would rise up to the call. Bless this study today, God. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to break down this text and see how it applies to us and how we need to look at this text. And we'll be looking at some of the other Gospels, too, and other places where the Great Commission is given. But he starts off by saying... That all authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. Exousia. The idea is, is that he is in control of everything. Has power over everything. He has the power to do anything. Now, I could really go deep into this first part of our text. But I just want to establish this. God is God. He has power over every situation. He has power and control over the winds and the rains, over cancer, over sickness, over the coronavirus, and everything else that faces our lives. Every obstacle, He holds the atoms together and could let them loose at any moment. He has total authority. And that is something that's critical as we move through this text, to remember that and to believe it. But we see in verse 19, it says, Go, therefore. Or you could say, therefore, go. The idea is, is whenever you see the therefore, you've got to ask, what is it there for? Well, remember, it's the God with all authority who is sending you. All right? The God of all authority is sending you to preach the gospel. In Mark 16, 15, he says almost the same thing. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's what God is calling us to do. And by us, I mean me and you. Us. All of us. We're all called to one level or another to preach the gospel. Well, who am I? Oh, why would they would never listen to me? I'm not a pastor. You're a pastor, Joe. You're, you're a preacher. I'm just a nobody. Well, that's the thing, is that I'm a nobody too. We're all a bunch of nobodies. In fact, I don't care who you are, and no one really cares who I am. At the end of the day, who we are doesn't matter. What matters is who am I speaking on behalf of? Whose authority am I speaking on behalf of? You see, in 2 Corinthians 5.20, Paul says, now then, we are ambassadors. An ambassador is someone who represents the king or the president or the nation. We are ambassadors for Christ. And as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's all we have to do. We, little nobodies, have to speak on the authority of God. 
You see, if a man just stopped me on the side of the road and just said, hey, I want you to get out of your car and have a talk with me, that'd be weird. Uh, it'd be kind of unnerving. I'd be nervous. What, what is this crazy man doing? And I probably wouldn't listen to him. I definitely would not want my wife or my children, my teenage daughter. I would, no, if that ever happens, honey, you roll the window up and you go. But if the same man was wearing a uniform and had a badge, he's the exact same man. But now I understand he's not speaking on his own authority. He's speaking on the authority of the law. He's speaking on the authority of the police. And that person, I would tell my daughter, no, honey, you do what he says. You respect him and you listen. And that's the power you have. When you speak on behalf of God, it doesn't matter who you are. It's not about your authority. It's about his authority. And Jesus Christ, who is giving the Great Commission, has been given all authority. Every authority of every power and principality and heavenly thing on earth is his authority. We have the authority to speak these things, to preach the gospel. What is it? I'm not a good preacher. You know what? If you're saved, you know the message. If you don't know the message, I'd be worried about your salvation. In Luke 24, 46 to 48, he basically explains what needs to be preached. He says, All right, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. We know Jesus died for us, and he was resurrected. And that repentance and the remissions of sin should be preached to all nations. So that's the idea, is that we just need to explain to people the most simple of things. I don't know much, but I know Jesus died for me. He rose for me. And that I need to repent and turn from my sins. But in doing so, I receive the remission, the forgiveness and washing away of my sins. I can tell that to anybody. And as ambassadors for Christ, I can be as if God himself is the one speaking, but he's pleading through me, be reconciled to God. We're begging you, be reconciled to God. That is the message of the cross. That is the message of salvation. That is the message we are supposed to bring to the nations. Now, I found all these one-liners that over the years I've heard them again and again. I don't even know who to attribute them to because I've heard them from so many different pastors. But maybe one of these will just hit home with you. right? The church is always one generation away from extinction. I've seen churches get old because there was no new life being brought into them. The whole church is always one generation from extinction. If new believers are not being born again into the body of Christ, she will become extinct. And that's the idea of being born again. Another one-liner is that God has no grandchildren. He only has blood-bought and born-again children. You were born again into His family. Your kids are not guaranteed in unless they're born again into His family. That's the way it works. We need to continue to see people getting born again. The churches of Grandview and Prosser and Sunnyside, the whole lower valley, we need to see people getting born again and not just church hopping. I don't want church growth just from people shifting from one place to another. We want to see unbelievers coming to repentance. And so it's been said that you are either a missionary or you are the mission field. There's only two. Which are you? If you have submitted your life to Jesus, you are a missionary because you're sent out with the gospel. Or you're the mission field. I would challenge you to say, if I tell you today you're a missionary and you tell me, no, I'm not, then you're probably the mission field. We really, this is a challenging message. It's challenging for me. I love how I've heard Greg Laurie put it. He's a great evangelist, does big crusades, but he says sometimes it's easier to preach the gospel. In fact, I think he says it is always easier for me to preach the gospel from behind the pulpit than it is one-on-one -on -one with someone on the street. But he says, I know I have to do it because I have to lead my flock by example. I've been trying to go out of my way more lately to just be sharing the gospel with people at random, to get out there, because if the church doesn't evangelize, the church will fossilize. I'm not called to be an evangelist. Well, Timothy was a pastor. But the second to last thing, or the last you might say, 
Paul's final words, his final commands. If you don't include the say hello to commands at the end of 2 Timothy, he says, do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. All of us are called to the work. All disciples are called to making disciples. You see, not one Christian is exempt from serving God. We're all called to serve, too. It's not about if, it's about where. Where has God called you to serve? How has God called you to serve? Again, tonight, I want to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 tonight, and maybe Romans 12 as well, and we'll be taking a look at where and how we serve within the body. But everyone's called to make disciples. And that's where it goes on in Matthew 28. He says, go therefore. And I guess I don't want to forget the word go. Many of us and many of you, if I challenged you and said, are you out there making disciples and winning the lost? If we say, well, I have friends and people that I'm you know, ministering to here and there. The command is go. In fact, it's actually written, interestingly, in the Greek, it's in the past tense, like having gone. You see, it's, it's supposed to be a foregone conclusion. Jesus is assuming they're going to go. We have to go in one way, shape, or form. I want to challenge you. Make some sort of conscious effort to go. I may say, have you ever shared Jesus with someone recently? You might say yes, but I go, have you set aside any time of your life in the last month to actively pursue someone to share the gospel with them? Many people have told me, I used to do some door-to-door. -door. I'm not called a door-to-door. -door. Yeah, you're probably not called a door-to-door, -door, but imagine if everyone, every Christian of Grandview, every Christian in the town you live in, went out and knocked on three doors and just tried to tell people that Jesus loves them and he died for them and they need to repent. But yeah, you might not be called to it. You might fumble through it. But what the power would be if the church mobilized and started to share the gospel and started to get out there and let people know. Spurgeon says, if you have no uh, heart no care for the unsaved. You're hardly saved yourself. Or he's concerned that you're hardly saved yourself. To imagine that I wouldn't care if people are saved or lost. I often pray that God would continue to open my eyes and make me see people as dead men walking. But this actually isn't a message on evangelism. You see, evangelism is actually something the church does okay at. It does okay. But I think what we're poorer at is making disciples. You see, he says make disciples. It isn't a matter of just getting people saved and going to church, but it's a matter of growing people up in the Lord. It's a matter of training people and preparing people to serve God and to serve His people and to win the lost. How do we do that? He says we need to make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here's a bonus teaching for you. That is a key word. It'll come up in a second. The name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, it's only singular name. It's not the names of the Father and the names of the Son. It's one, one God, who is the Father, who is the Son, and who is the Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. A little Trinitarian uh, teaching for you of how to understand the Trinity. But we're supposed to baptize people. Why? Because if you preach the gospel, the next thing the person should do is make it public. I was tempted to say there are no closet Christians. That's not true, but there shouldn't be. People will receive Jesus Christ and never have that opportunity to publicly vocalize it. And some will go to the grave that way. And sometimes we pray and hope that that is true of loved ones whom we don't know where they were at. But it ought not be so, right? No one should die a closet Christian. The first thing you should do is you make it public. And there's something powerful about a testimony. There's something powerful about a new believer sharing their newfound faith. And baptism is the way we show the world that we have had our sins washed away. And the old me has died. And the new me has been born again. Now, how do we make disciples? Well, it's simple. 
It's in chapter 28, verse 20, the next verse. Teaching them to observe all the things I commanded you. What should you be trying to learn if you want to be a disciple? Everything. Learn it all. Oh, but I'm not a, I'm not a studious person, or I'm not you know, one of those brainy Christians. I'm, I'm just going to tell you that there are no such thing as uh, illiterate or illiterate Christians or disciples. I'm sorry. Disciples, not Christians. You see, disciples, we, we, we have to learn the Word of God. We have to study. In Luke 24, 27, you see, he told them to teach them these things. Well, what things? Well, on the road to Emmaus, he had the two disciples there with him. And he says in verse 27, or it says, Beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures and things concerning himself. That's the idea. We have to be learning the Word of God and teaching it to new people so that they themselves can become disciples. I think every Christian needs to be being discipled and discipling. And I think you, right now, should be able to say, whom am I being discipled by? And whom am I discipling? And if you can't, you should really take some time to think about that and make a decision. Now, right off the bat, I'm going to tell you what. I don't count as the one discipling you if Sunday mornings is all you get. Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, you're doing better. But truthfully, you need someone to have one-on-one -on -one conversation with to be bouncing things off of, to be challenging you, to be examining your walk in your life. Someone who will be there and be a brother or a sister who's really going to push you and challenge you and grow you. Now, there are some of you in the church who might be able to say that about me. We have enough one-on-one -on -one contact. And I'm only one man, and I, I can't be the discipler of an entire church body. It's going to take everyone to do this. If you're a more mature believer you should be picking out some people or praying that God would bring them to you that you could be pouring into. Yet again, if you're a really mature believer, you're not excused from this. I have people who are discipling me still. Yes, some is books. Some is audio sermons. But I have a, a brother, I have Aaron Bloom, who will be pushing me. He is a brother who just, he pushes me and he keeps me accountable. I have pastors who are senior to me. They have experience like Dallas Sandoval or Steve Winery or Tony Magana and these men whom I'm going to for counsel and direction and guidance. I'm still being discipled and I'm discipling. And maybe you're a newer believer. Maybe you feel like you don't know anything. How could I disciple someone? Well, guess what? Make a disciple. If you're saved, then you should know the message we just expressed. Jesus died on the cross and he rose again so that I have the ability to repent and have remission of sins. Teach that to someone. And then you teach them everything you know. We can only raise up disciples as strong and as knowledgeable as we are. So you should have someone you're pouring into. You should have someone pouring into you. If we started this process, we would see so much growth and so much benefit in the church body. And I mean the capital C, us reaching out to people. I have people who come to me sometimes from other churches. I don't ever intend them to join our church or to become a part of our fellowship, but I want to see them poured into by someone and I'm willing to do it. I'll pour into anyone who seeks it. You see, in the early church, this is what the disciples did. It says when the, the 3,000 got saved on the day of Pentecost, right? It says that they all, these people, not the apostles, but just the regular people who had just gotten saved, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Now, where could we do something like that? Home? A home fellowship? You and just a couple of families from the church, you and one family from the church, making it 
a regular thing in your life that you get together with them. You go through the Apostles' Doctrine. That's just the Word of God. The Apostles wrote the New Testament, right? We get together, we talk about the Word. Break bread. Whether you take that as communion or just having a meal, both would be worthwhile to do. And you fellowship while you're together, and you pray. How simple is the disciple-making process? It just takes us deciding that I am going to go and do these things. And when I do these things, when two or more are gathered, Jesus says, I'll be there among you. I'll be with you. That's how he finishes off the chapter. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That's the idea. Is Christ is with us, and he will be with us, and he'll support us through all these things. A cool story is G. Campbell Morgan was teaching this little study to a, a few elderly women from his church when he was a young preacher. And he got to the end of the book and he says, isn't that a wonderful promise? And one of the ladies looked at him and said, young man, that's not a promise. That's a fact. You know, most of the promises of the Bible are conditional. If we, then God will. This isn't a promise. It's, it's a fact. Christ is with us. He's always with us. He never forsakes us. He's always there when we call on him. You see, not only is he with us, just you know, the thought, but he's given us his Holy Spirit. Most of the places we see the promises of the Great Commission, we also see the promise of the sending of the Holy Spirit. In Luke 24, he said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. He tells them to tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. That for them to succeed in all this, they need the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8 pretty much says the same thing. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. That's the idea. He's with us. His Holy Spirit's inside of us, giving us power. We speak on His authority. We have everything we need to be disciples and to make disciples. And so the question of the day is, why doesn't everyone make disciples and become a disciple? And I think it's just simple. Discipleship comes with a cost. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, German theologian, he was hanged on my birthday in 1947 in Nazi concentration camp. He was taken in by the Nazis. His greatest book was called The Cost of Discipleship, and he talks about there's a cost involved. The cost is, is this world. Billy Graham said salvation is free, but discipleship costs everything we have. Does that sound a little intense? Well, maybe we should just quote Jesus instead. Jesus said in Luke 14, Likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Forsake all that I have. It seems so extreme. It seems so intense. But Jesus says in Matthew 16, 25, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever desires to save his life, to keep it, if you want to cling on to the things of this world, you want to cling on to sports, you want to cling on to money, you want to cling on to people, you want to cling on to things and clothes and cars or whatever it may be, you want to cl cling on to your beauty sleep. <laughs> Jesus says at the end of it all, you're going to lose it. But if you're willing to let it all go and just say, Lord, I'm... I'm yours. He's like, you're going to receive riches and blessings that are beyond comprehension. You will be blessed. Do you want to know how you know that's a sure thing? That, that verse we just read, whoever seeks his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will find it. That verse is very unique in that it's found in all four Gospels and it's found multiple times in all four Gospels. The idea that one verse is copied, he, he preached it more than once. This wasn't a one-time thing that Jesus taught. And all four writers caught it. There's actually very few quotes of Jesus that are found in all four Gospels. He must have been serious when he said it. That we would just give up our lives and just live for him. 
I want to go back and challenge you again. And this message is just on my heart because I just want to see people grow. I have no greater joy than to see my children walk in truth. I have no greater joy than to find out you've been growing in Jesus. But my fear for you, my church, my fear for my own church is that we would become enthralled with the Word of God, Bible teaching, and our own growth and that we would fail to apply the Great Commission and to go out and be growing others. It's a blast. I have fun learning the Bible, but if I'm not pouring it out, if I'm being continually poured into, but not poured out, I become stagnant and dead. I forget who wrote it. it may have been Redpath or F.B. Meyer, but the idea that the Dead Sea in Israel, it is fed by the Jordan, but there's no outlet. And that's why it is the Dead Sea. It is continually poured into, but it never actually pours out. And that sea is dead as dead can be. Nothing can live in those conditions. And if you're being fed, but you're doing no feeding of others, I would challenge you. To my senior saints, to my most mature believers in this church body, who is your mentor? Who is pouring into you? Where are you seeking growth from? To the new believers, young believers, and to every one of you, who are you trying to disciple right now? Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's your sister. Maybe it's a friend. But is there another Christian? You've, they're converted and now you're building them up and you're trying to pour into them. You see, I think if we just generalize this and just think, well, I'm always helping people. It's easy to lose track of saying, no, I've got three people and I'm going to hold them accountable. I'm going to be reaching out to them and I'm going to build them up strong enough that they can go out and repeat the process. I want to close with a verse, or not a verse, a quotation. And um, I'm going to make a special announcement at the end of our service today, at the end of worship and whatnot. So I hope you'll hang around to hear that. But... Warren Wearsby says this, how much faster our churches would grow and how much stronger and happier our church members would be if each one were discipling another believer. The only way the local church can be fruitful and multiply, not just add, is with a systematic discipleship program. This is the responsibility of every believer and not just a small group who have been called to go. And so I would challenge you. Jesus says, go and make disciples. It is something we all need to be doing. And I want to wrap this back to the very beginning. What is the meaning of life? Well, it's to glorify God and to enjoy Him. You will glorify God by obeying the Great Commission. And I believe if you've never committed to obeying the Great Commission and you start to, you are going to find an enjoyment in this life that you've never experienced before. Seeing lost sinners come to repentance. Seeing the dead brought to life. Seeing people grow. You teaching them the Bible. 2 Timothy 2.4 says, All who desire to be servants must be able to teach. Okay? You teaching them what you know and you going and seeking it elsewhere to grow so that you can feed them all the more. You will be satisfied with a satisfaction that you have never experienced before. And then finding out where in the body of Christ has God designed you to edify your brothers and sisters. We'll look at that tonight in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And I pray that He is growing you right now so that you can be used by Him to grow others. Lord Jesus, we will follow You because we love You. We know, God, that when we seek your face in spirit and truth, that you come, that you hear, and that you answer us. 
when we lay our lives before you, Lord, you never refuse us. We ask, God, that you would do it again in our hearts. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet I'm waiting for change to come Knowing the battles won For you have never failed me Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness This is my commands, you never fail me, yeah. I know. Oh, I know the night won't last, but your word will come. My heart will sing your praise again Jesus, you're still enough Keep me within your love My heart will sing your praise again Promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail. Promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. This is my confidence, you never fail me I'm
darkness still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands, God This is my confidence You never fail Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hand This is my confidence You never fail me yet I never will forget You never fail me yet I never will forget Well, I hope you were able to grab some communion elements. And if not, just pray with me right now as we take of the Lord's Supper together. Father God, I thank you that you became a man, that you sent your son Jesus to die for us on the cross, that his body would be beaten and broken so that we would not have to live lives beaten and broken, but that we could be born again to live and to serve you, God. Thank you for your body as we take it together. And to pray for the cup. Lord Jesus, your blood was shed for many. I pray, Lord, that we all, God, would continue to share that news. That your blood was shed so that many could be brought to repentance, God. Lord, help us to spread the news that you died for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for the blood. Amen. Well, we'll continue to worship, and then uh, I'll close us at the end of today's service. Despite your holy name And I know in new sin So you And there I forged my soul to chain Went captive to my own desires Went blue with guilt and unnamed shame Your long arm reached into the mind And plucked me out Blessed be your name Can I leave others in their woe? Can I ignore their cries who sink? Forbid it alone, I'll rise and go Between you and them to be a link Unwearied may I lift the load Of those who struggle, needs and spell Set my poor heart with the strong gold To battle powers of earth and hell I'll rise and go Help me to Break my heart and bring me to my knees I'll rise and go Give me your heart Cause this old world, oh, it's falling apart 
All this world's wealth is far too small To barter for the judgment day When powers and thrones and wealth and all Forever shall pass away O oh, day of days when I shall be Standing before ten million eyes Oh may my Savior say to me Well done is my eternal prize I'll arise and go Help me to see Jesus break my heart And bring me to my knees I'll arise and go Give me your heart Cause this old world Oh it's falling apart I'll arise and go Help me to see Break my heart and bring me to my knees I'll rise and go Give me your heart Cause this whole world, oh, it's falling apart It's falling apart When I shall stand before your great mercy, tell me, my Lord, to understand that out in the will of God could be. And on that day, when I shall stand before your All right, well, that concludes our service for today. And like I said earlier, I had one final announcement. I just wanted to save it to the end because I mentioned in today's message that I, I shouldn't count necessarily to be the discipler of many of you, that I, I think people need more than just Sunday services. Coming and getting a sermon is edifying for all. But it's not enough to be called discipleship. We need one-on-one. -on -one. We need conversation. We need iron sharpening iron. And so speaking of discipleship and making disciples, starting up in, I believe, one month. I've just started a countdown clock now. I can't wait any longer. <laughs> In one month, I'm going to start hosting a discipleship class at my house, assuming we can fit everyone in my house. I fit like 30 people in there, my living room before, so we should be okay. But we're going to start a discipleship class or a school of ministry class, really. My goal is to move a group of people in one year through a series of courses that I believe would make a very well-rounded disciple who is fully capable to then go and make disciples. Those disciples who Jesus says go and make disciples, they had been under his teaching for three years. And so during this time, we will have some homework. 
I'm going to hopefully provide some books for people to read, but we're also going to be moving through a series of videos and having conversations. Anyone is invited to come. And you don't necessarily have to be signed on for the full package deal if you just want to come for a portion of it. And friends are invited to bring friends and all of that. But for a group of you, I hope you'd make a commitment that you would be willing to arrange your schedules and prioritize this, that you could receive some real serious training, that you could become equipped to spread the gospel and to make disciples of your own. And so my intent is for us to be taking courses in theology, so learning just the basics of what we believe, but having some good discussions so that we feel like we thoroughly understand these things. Evangelism, spending time so that we all can feel like we have been trained and we have practiced some form of evangelism. Apologetics, Defending the faith, we'll be looking at the false religions and cults. We'll be looking at key and controversial topics in the church. And finally, church history. There is a church history course I would like us to move through where we look at just how, what has gone on over the last 2,000 years in the church. And I think all of these things will be extremely fruitful and edifying for anyone who'd like to sign on um, I probably should come up with some sort of a, a form or interest thing. I, I wasn't necessarily ready to announce this, but with today's message, it just seemed like today was the day. And if I don't set a date, it probably would never happen. Just like if you don't make a decision to go and make disciples, if you don't make a concerted effort, it just might never happen. And so we're going to start that course up. I believe it'll be on Thursday nights but it might be another night of the week. Once we get a group of people who are solidly interested and the ones who perhaps want to really commit to doing the homework, we'll have sermons to listen to during the week and whatnot, uh, we'll find out a day that works for everybody. God bless you guys. I love you guys. I miss you guys. And I pray that you are using this time for God to grow you and strengthen you.